Today we're going to talk about the use of technology on the program Portrait Artist of the Year. Let's get started. And if you would be so kind, please consider leaving me a thumb, thumbs up and please subscribe. So here we go. Joe McKenzie here. On this episode of Portrait Artist of the Year, what I want to talk about is not an actual episode, but technology used in the program, because I've been talking with my friends again. When I start talking to my friends, ideas happen. So the thing that came up is some of my artist friends, and, and these are portrait artist friends. I just want to be clear about that, because I wanted to keep the stream clear. When I do Landscape Artist of the Year, if I do Landscape Artist of the Year, I'll talk to my landscape friends. But this was specifically portrait artist people, and they fall into two camps. One is the heavy use of technology that's used in the program is not, not, not good. And the other is, yeah, you know, any, the way you get to the end of the painting is the way that you get to the end of, ending of the painting. You know, how to begin to describe what te technology is. You know, is technology the fact that we don't have to uh, ha build a fire? make our own paints, <laughs> you know, rub rocks together, you know, all of that. You know, at some point, all technology was new and maybe came with, with adjustments. And I'm not going to get into AI because I think at this point that makes everybody, especially in the world right now with everything going on, like crazy, crazy nervous. So we're not going to talk about that. We talk about technology as we know it in our studios. So I'm sitting in my studio right now. I have a microphone, I have a camera I'm talking to you with, I have a computer, I have an iPad, and I have lots of tripods and stands. Um, yeah, hair dryer, I don't think that's considered high techno technology, but you know, you know, where does technology begin, where does it end? But let's get back to the, the program. Uh, my portrait artist friends in general feel that it's quite insulting to be on the program and ignore the model for the most part because some of these painters come in and they take some resource photos and they work directly from the photo and you can see them with their heads down the entire time and never look at the model again and you know their feeling is why have the reference there at all if you're not going to use it um, now besides the technology you know the fact that you have an iPod iPad is great but it's only great if you if you use it for something right so the way I use my iPad is, uh, well, I use it in a variety of ways. One is I have a program called NOTAN, N-O-T-A-N, which gives me a value study so I can judge whether the photograph is worthy of even participating it with at all. And I also have something called Snap Markup. Neither of these things is very expensive. I think they're each under $4. I've used them for years and years and years. Snap Markup allows me to Let's say I have a color, I'm not sure if I want to have a dark blue background or whether I want to have a pink background. In the old days, what you'd have to do is create a wash and it was just complicated. Now all you have to do is use something like Snap Markup and use your finger or, or a iPad pen and change the color and see what will work the best. I seldom use it because I usually have a very good instinct for what's, what I from the very beginning of my painting to the very end of where I'm going to go. But again, within that technology piece, you know, it's not just the, the thing you can hold. There's a whole world of possibilities inside these machines. Of course, there's things like, um, you know, gridding. Um, gridding has been going on since the Renaissance and probably before then. But now you can buy different gridding programs put your photo in and it'll grid it right on your iPad. And you see a lot of people uh, doing that on the program, using the iPad in order to uh, grid their canvas. The other thing that you can do, which I, again, I don't do this either, <laughs> is, is Photoshop. I mean, let's say you want to have a portrait of somebody and you also want to have a, a, a tree in the background and a flock of birds. You can work all that out in Photoshop in terms of size, proportion, color, fit, all of it before you ever put your paint together and work on the canvas. And I know a lot of people who do that. And a lot of people who do this are 
um, professional artists. And the reason they do it is because time is money. And the faster they can get to the end of the painting, the faster they can get to the end of the commission, it means that they can be more productive. And when you're an artist and you're working for yourself, you can't turn to your little sidekick and say, hey, you got this one? Because <laughs> they don't. It's you. It's you all the time. So you're looking for some uh, time-saving devices and also, you know, success. Where I fall down on this for the most part is I don't care how a painting's done. I've never asked. I've I have quite a collection of paintings, small and large, and I've never asked the artist, how did they do it? I don't care how they did it. It's sort of like going to a magic show and finding out how people did the magic trick. And I, well, I don't wanna know. That's, that's not why I buy the, the, the piece of work. It's not why I love the piece of work. Um, the most extreme professional, I mean, really successful, I mean, in the National Gallery of the Art and, and all that stuff. Um, this person has since passed on. I'm not gonna mention his name. I probably should, but I'll let it go. Um, near the end of his life, uh, he showed his process. Some artists don't, but he showed his process. He does these enormous florals. I mean, like an enormous peony, like the size of, of you know, like, we're talking feet, you know, five feet by seven feet kind of thing. And what he would do in his studio was he would project the image. He would project the image of the flower onto the wall and then put his paper, he had special paper made because most of us can't buy paper <laughs> that size, and would work with the projector and the image directly on the wall, which I once tried to do because I was curious about how you do it, but boy, it's, very, it, it's impossible for me to see color in that um, kind of environment. It's like having a light shine in your eyes at the same time you're trying to develop, um, decide what the value and color of a shape is. It's, it's impossible. But I found that when, when, I, when I read that particular article, I thought, oh, I'm done. I'm done with this in terms of a discussion of whether it's, it's cheating or, or whether you should use it or not. I mean, that's, that's a standard right now. That's what people do. It's also what I see when I go to uh, people's studios, friends, you know, real professionals, um, they all have one of those projectors in their studio. And I don't think it's there to collect dust. I'm not saying that they use it every day, but there are specific times when it's a really helpful tool. That's not something you would bring to Portrait Artist of the Year, especially because, um, you know, the whole point of the program is what can you do in four hours and how can we compare and contrast your technique, your style, your take with other people. So, um, now, I'm always curious to know if you've noticed that in the program, the heavy use of technology. It's gone on since the very beginning of the program, which would have been, I'm guessing right now, um, I'm gonna guess like around 2015 or so, and now we're in 2024. So it would be very interesting, you know, if we went all the way back, if this program had started in 2005, we would have had digital phones, but I don't know that we would have had these, all these different kind of possibilities in terms of apps for help, for helping us. Um, but I think it's just the standard of how people work now. Um, uh, if it's me, I'm going to use, <laughs> if it's me, I'm going to use every tool necessary in order to succeed, which means I'm going to use that model. I'm going to use my iPad. I'm going to use my phone. I'm going to use, you know, earphones with music on it so I can have my playlist that I like to paint to. I'm going to make sure I have, you know, the mini fridge right next door so I can, you know, I got the foods I need. Yeah, a little bit of a control freak, of course. But my point just being, I care about the what how you get to the end of the painting, and that's really all I care about when I'm looking at these people paint as well. Um, I, I just want to say one more thing. There's always one more thing. And the one more thing is, um, you know, people talk a lot about talent and the arts. And I believe talent is involved in the arts. But I don't think it really, uh, more than anything, I think it's uh, time on task, time on paper, and practice. And then all these tools are really great. But you could have all these tools. You could have, you know, the greatest studio ever all the assistants in the world, it, it's not, it's, this is not something you can buy. You know, you can't buy this, this skill. It's, 
this is something that you have to earn over a long period of time by, pra by practice. And, and the hardest thing I think for some of us to accept, or maybe I'll speak for myself, is the fact that um, when I started out, boy, did I get a lot of praise for um, paintings that I did were like, that were like Andrew Wyeth's. I, I specialized in birds, you know, every single feather. Oh boy, yeah, those were the days. Um, and I could do it, and I knew that I could continue to do it, and I realized that at, at, at one point I decided I, I hate doing this. Once I learned more about what painting was, that it wasn't about these individual parts, I could always uh, reproduce one, you know, something. I could always reproduce, but I realized that's not going to sustain me over my lifetime. I need to have, I need to feel emotion about what I'm painting, I need to feel a certain way. And for me, that developed into a real interest in the space between things. I'm actually not that interested in the things that I paint, I'm more interested in the space around the things that I paint and the different design elements that create those spaces. And in the end, I am a representational painter. I don't do abstracts, but it's almost by default. <laughs> But that's been a slow evolution, and that's what I like to do. So that's a, that's, that was definitely a sidebar. So the question really is, you know, how do you feel about technology in the program? I have not read in the guidelines that there are any specific rules about it. So I don't know. But I think for each one of us, we have to make our own decisions about these things. So remember to keep the whites of your paper white. I always say remember to keep the whites of your paper white, your paint's wet. I say remember to keep the whites of your paper white because if you're a watercolors paint, painter, if you drive over your whites, you cannot get them back. And keep your paints wet because if you're a watercolor painter and you let your paints dry out, it means that you're not painting. And if you keep them moist or wet, it means that you're painting every day. So keep the whites of your paper white, your paints wet, and then I talk about massing for value. Look for those values that are light, dark, or medium and then mix your color and insert, let's say you mix three different colors and then match them to the mass, insert those colors into your mass. That's what I mean. Mix over here and then go to the value of what you have decided is your shape. So that's what I, so that's the tagline. Remember to keep the white to your paper white, your paint's wet, mass for value, mix for color. Um, thanks for watching. Please thumbs up and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.